Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. President Biden was in Kansas City, Missouri today, touting his bipartisan infrastructure law. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said earlier the trip was meant to demonstrate how the president is following through on his promise to forge bipartisan consensus and prove our democracy can deliver big wins for the American people. Meanwhile, concerns are growing over inflation, pushing up the cost of living for Americans. A new Monmouth University poll shows while approval for the president hovers around 40 percent, support for his spending plan remains solid. Sixty-six percent support the bipartisan infrastructure plan recently signed into law, while 61 percent support his proposed social and climate spending plan. There are also new developments related to the deadly January 6th attack on the nation's capital. The select committee is moving forward with a criminal contempt referral against former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. After initially agreeing to cooperate with the investigation, Meadows abruptly withdrew that cooperation. As the events of that day and the subsequent political fallout continue to shape discourse on Capitol Hill, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, while the Capitol is safer than it was a year ago, she remembers clearly the trauma of that day. I'll never forgive President, former President of the United States and his lackeys and his bullies that he sent to the Capitol for the trauma that he, that was, in, what was exerted on our staff. These are young, largely younger people who come with idealism to work in the Capitol on either side of the aisle. When I saw what it meant to the staff, the way it traumatized them, it was frightening. For more, let's bring in Chris Van Cleve, Zeke Miller, and Sarah Westwood. Chris is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Zeke is a CBS News political contributor and a White House reporter for the Associated Press. And Sarah is an investigative and political reporter for the Washington Examiner. Welcome. It's good to have you all. Zeke, let me start with you. The Associated Press has some new reporting on some of the tangible results from that meeting between Presidents Biden and Putin. What exactly is President Putin committing to? Um, this is uh, still very notional at the moment, uh, but it has uh, a little bit to do with uh, maybe some prospects of uh, de-escalation uh, on, on the uh, eastern Ukrainian front uh, with regards to Don, the Donbass region uh, of, of Ukraine. Uh, separately, uh, there was some progress movement toward easing the uh, ongoing, you know, years long, really, Back, uh, tit for tat between the United States and Russia over their diplomatic presence, uh, presences, their embassies and consulates in each other's countries. Um, that was a, a fairly significant priority because it, it's very quickly nearing the point where the U.S. embassy in Moscow uh, can't function. Uh, still, no more announcements. No, no, no reason to sort of uh, just to to, uh, to celebrate uh, on either side just yet. No concrete developments, but uh, some steps, indications that maybe something down the line will materialize. And we heard, heard both from President Putin, who said this just a strategic security dialogue. Uh, he would propose extending that uh, beginning. Uh, he proposed details of that in the next couple of days. And from the and from President Biden saying he expected to lay out details of additional high level calls and talks between the U.S. and Russia probably around Friday or over the weekend. So more talks maybe in the direction toward progress, but no tangible deliverables just yet. Okay. All right. Notional being the key word here, uh, Zeke. So, Chris, after some delay, the House passed the National Defense Authorization Act. What's notable about this legislation? Well, so this is an annual must-pass piece of legislation that directs the military how to spend, it, spend its budget. Now, because it got bogged down in the Senate over a battle about how many amendments would be heard to it, this is a compromise measure uh, that's going to be passed through the House and now to go to the Senate without any amendments. So uh, it's a compromise, which means nobody got everything they wanted. So, you know, while it passed overwhelmingly, pretty much every side had something to gripe about. It is uh, nearly 700 and $77 billion, which is more than uh, the Biden administration had sought. So some progressive Democrats were unhappy with the size of it. Republicans got uh, more money that they were hoping to have there. Uh, this includes uh, an effort to overhaul how the military handles sexual assault cases, but it did not go as far as some members of the Senate wanted with a, a more thorough overhaul of the military justice system. Uh, Coming out of the bill was also an effort to 
deauthorize the war in Iraq. Um, also, there had been a, an effort to try to require women to register for the Selective Service for the draft. That came out. Um, but what you do see in there is a pay raise for, for troops that pretty much everybody is going to support. Uh, there's also going to be a review of the Afghanistan war and its legacy. It's a, it's a very large piece of legislation, so there's, a, there's tons of things in there. There's uh, some wins for, for all sides and, and some things that, that people are walking away unhappy with. But, uh, you know, I, what's most significant is, is that this got passed after it had ground to a halt in the Senate. And remember, this is a must-pass bill. Everybody knew they had to pass it, mm -hmm. uh, and it just stopped, you know, <laughs> it just stopped working. Right, right. Um, all right. Well, Sarah, the House committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection says it is moving forward with a criminal contempt referral for former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows. Um, that is how the proceedings began when it came to Steve Bannon. So could this ultimately help Mark Meadows politically? Well, certainly Mark Meadows would benefit more politically from the perception that he's not cooperating with the panel than if he were uh, perceived as being friendly with them and sharing information with them that could be detrimental to former President Donald Trump. But it's not clear that the committee is going to get an indictment out of their referral for Mark Meadows the way that they did with Steve Bannon, because the cases here are a little bit different. In both cases, in both Bannon and Meadows tried to exert executive privilege over the documents and the lines of questioning that the committee was seeking answers to. In Bannon's case, Bannon was not working in the Trump White House when the January 6th attack occurred. And so the committee successfully convinced the Justice Department to bring this indictment because there was no uh, privileged material in their eyes that Bannon would have been privy to as an outsider. Mark Meadows was Trump's chief of staff, though, when the January 6th attacks took place, and so that he may have more of a legitimate claim to executive privilege, but there are some stickier points here for Meadows. One of them is the fact that he was using his personal device to uh, conduct some of the communications that the committee is interested in. So it will be really interesting to see whether this case sort of plays out the same way as the Bannon case or whether because Meadows was a senior White House aide, he can sort of benefit from Trump's exertion of executive privilege here. Well, Zeke, the White House's summit on democracy is slated for the next two days. Who are the notable guests and what's on the agenda? Uh, it is a uh, traditional, you know, U uh, U.S. allies, as well as some uh, uns unsuspect names. That Pakistan was invited. Uh, some Af uh, African nations were invited. It's an attempt by on the part of the Biden administration to sort of, uh, really, for President Biden to sort of crystallize his what has been a theme of his first year in office is this generational ch challenges struggle between democracies and autocracies, and this is an attempt for the president to convene uh, many of the world's leading democracies. And rally them in that struggle to that cause, um, and, and, and sort of try to orient that framework. And that sort of positions them. It's interesting, uh, given the, the timing here, just a couple of days after uh, the president's uh, uh, call. We were talking about with Russian President Vladimir Putin, and also after the U.S. and now a number of allies have announced a diplomatic boycott of the, the Beijing uh, Winter Olympic Games next year. Um, two significant data points in part of the president to rally allies um, against what are against essentially autocracies. Um, the, the challenge for the president here is that this is uh, you know, a lot of these democracies view democracy and treat democracy very differently and have different norms and, and procedures and their democracies look very different in, in times of the United States. And also, it comes at a time when the U.S.'s own commitment to democracy has faced its you know, most fundamental test, and it has in 150 years after the January 6th insurrection, as we were just talking about. So, um, you know, the president, as much as the president is trying to rally democracies to the cause, he has to also prove that the U.S. is still there to lead that charge uh, for years to come. And that's, that's a, a significant task for him, given domestic politics. And Zeke, why did some members of Congress write a letter to the White House saying the planning of this summit felt, ironically, less than democratic? Now, there's, uh, there's some, some people who are not, uh, who were le left, some nations that were left off the agenda, were not invited, Turkey among them, uh, who were not really thrilled about that, uh, as well as uh, the way the White House is constructed was constructed through largely by the White House and the, you know, with some, and the State Department. Members of Congress wanted to be sort of a broader whole of government approach, bipartisan approach that was really run here by the executive branch, and that uh, certainly raised some eyebrows up on the Hill. Well, Chris, the House passed legislation to pave the way for the Senate to increase the debt ceiling. What has the Republican reaction been? 
Well, you, you have a deal clearly in place between uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell to to, to navigate this sort of weird two-step process uh, to, to get the debt ceiling raised. So there's at least enough Republican support uh, to get it done. Uh, and basically how this will work is uh, the House passed a process change, a one-time sort of waiver, if you will, that will let the Senate vote on a simple majority, 51 votes, to raise the debt ceiling. But in order to get to the 51 vote, they have to, with a 60-vote margin, pass this process change. So you'll need 10 Republicans to vote for the process change, which uh, Mitch McConnell felt was a good enough deal to get to the point where you're then forcing uh, Democrats to make a party-line vote on raising the debt ceiling by a specific dollar. Uh, are Republicans happy about it? Rank-and-file Republicans are not thrilled, but there are clearly uh, an, at least 10 of them that are going to vote to progress this, it appears, uh, which will pave the way for uh, a relatively painless raising of the debt ceiling, avoiding uh, a default on the nation's debt. Uh, for Republicans, they will tie Democrats to a specific number, which they can use in attack ads down the line. And if you're the Democrats, well, you you kept one of your, your your goals for December, which was to stave off default. And ultimately, there just didn't appear to be much of an appetite uh, to bring the country to the brink of default uh, a week before Christmas. Yeah, it was surprising, Chris, looking at the calendar, because we've been here before, as you well know. And I think, uh, you know, for folks to see uh, some agreement here, it, not quite the 11th hour, perhaps almost the 11th hour is, is a bit surprising, but um, an interesting set of dynamics. Sarah, where does the White House's vaccine mandate stand in the legal challenges against it? And why might local requirements be more successful? Yeah, the Biden administration's vaccine mandates have not fared well in court so far. The private sector mandate requiring all employees of companies with 100 workers or more to get vaccinated was halted by multiple federal judges. And the president's vaccine mandate for federal contractors also has been temporarily stopped by a court. And in both of those cases, judges are basically telling the Biden administration that it doesn't really have the authority to implement these public health uh, rules, at least not through the vehicles that they were trying to do so with. With the federal contractor vaccine mandate, Biden was trying to use the Procurement Act, which sort of puts stipulations on what dynamics businesses have to have in order to win federal contracts to implement a vaccine mandate. A court said, you know, that's not really what that piece of legislation was meant to do to implement sweeping public health regulations. And then in the case of the private sector mandate, Biden was attempting to use OSHA, which is an arm of the Labor Department, to implement a rule. And again, judges are really skeptical that the Labor Department has the authority to implement such a strict public health requirement the federal government in general has never really imposed a vaccine mandate. And in fact, a lot of the arguments that proponents of vaccine mandates have cited when they were defending Biden's mandate are much more applicable to states and municipalities than to the federal government, because to the extent that vaccine mandates exist for other sorts of immunizations that have been you know, common for decades, those are implemented at the state and local level. There's never been one attempted by the federal government. That's why there are some legal experts, including one that I spoke to for a story that I wrote this week, are saying that potentially the private sector mandate that New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced this week could have more of a legal standing in court because those types of public health powers are more specifically delineated to the state and local level than to the federal government. And so when it comes to the question of authority for enforcement, New York City might have more to acclaim to that um, than the federal government does. Well, Chris, progressive Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is introducing a resolution to remove Congresswoman Lauren Boebert from her committee assignments after she made Islamophobic comments about Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Here's what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said about the situation. It's their responsibility to deal with their people. Well, how we deal with addressing the fear that they have instilled in the Islam, uh, with their Islamophobia and the rest is something that hopefully we can do in a bipartisan way. But the responsibility is on them. And um, I just went through a wealth of substance here. I don't feel like talking about what the Republicans aren't doing or are doing about the disgraceful, unacceptable behavior of their members. So, Chris, do you expect this resolution to move forward? 
you know, the, the speaker sort of dodged that question, saying she'd let us know when she's ready to, to let us know. Uh, you know, th th this is a little bit different than a, a couple of the other um, circumstances where you have seen uh, an effort move forward to to strip members of their of their committees, and there there is concern uh, amongst Democrats that that there is a potential slippery slope here, uh, and that this could be used against them should they lose uh, the majority in 2022. Uh, so it, it is possible. You you it seems that Speaker Pelosi. Um, has has made some promises about taking some kind of action, whether it will be this to, to actually seek a vote to strip uh, Lauren Bobart of her committee assignments. You know, that remains unclear, uh, but it, it is certainly in the realm of possibility. You could hear the frustration and anger in the speaker's voice there about uh, where the a level of uh, just uh, the, 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 the lack of, of I'm not even struggling with the word here, the, 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 the lack of being able to get interview. along. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, it's a level and, and of the, rancor that we just haven't seen, Chris. And I think it's the thing that um, I, I know we've talked about on the show, but, you know, these sort of norms being violated, right, in a place where, as you well know, um, Capitol Hill is very much a place, and Washington used to be a place governed very much by sort of tradition. And um, we have seen all kinds of boundaries crossed. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's hard, I think, for folks to maybe think about a different political time when people um, resolved their differences in a different way. But, I mean, you know, is this something, Chris, like just 10 years ago in your experience, you know, that we would have seen in Washington? It doesn't seem to me this is something that, um, you know, would have necessarily erupted in this manner. Yeah, I think that's 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 very true. The the the, the level of decorum uh, that surrounded the the way politicians talk to each other and House members talk to each other and disagreed, it has just changed. You know, the speaker yeah. um, flashed back to uh, Senator Bob Dole's time and how right. you could disagree about fundamental issues and it not turn into uh, the equivalent of a food fight on Twitter or uh, you know blatantly uh, objectionable comments and threats uh, that, that some members in the House feel are being levied, levied against them mm -hmm. by other members of the House. Uh, you know, the, the Speaker put metal detectors at the door, uh, the, the, the door to the House floor, because there was concern about members bringing guns on the House floor. Uh, it is just a very different time right now, and, and there's a level of toxicity that I think even surprises longtime members of Congress. Yeah, you wonder if the political discourse can ever sort of return. Um, that was the word. To the level, right, the level of discourse. It's, you know, it's something that has certainly changed, uh, to say the least. All right, well, Chris, Zeke, and Sarah, thank you all for breaking that down for us. We really appreciate it.